And we are so glad for those of you that are on campus right now, Siena, Cyprus, downtown, the Loop. It's awesome. It is so much more fun to have people in the room than to just have an empty room with a camera in the room. But for those of you that are online, we're glad you're online as well. We don't want you to feel shamed at all or, or uh, guilty at all about being that. If that's, if that's where you feel the most safe, man, we want you to be able to receive the Word of God as well in that time. But we are so glad to be able to get us all together in this time, to be able to enjoy our time together. And so we've been doing the five conversations uh, with Christ in I did two weeks um, on anxiety and worry, so we're only going to do four conversations, okay? So we we lost the conversation because we went on two weeks of that. But we did distractions with Mary and Martha, which was great. We did two weeks on anxiety and worry. And I want you to know, today we're going to talk about humility is what we're talking about. But let me tell you why we did two weeks on anxiety and worry. Here's why. Because I want to let you know the book that we're going to study this year. Um, We're going to kick it off after Labor Day. So a little bit of a drum roll here. This has created anxiety and worry in me because we're going to go for it after Labor Day with the book of Revelation is where we're going to go. All right, so get excited. Those that are believers are cheering. Those that aren't sure are like, oh no, beast out of the sea. I don't know if I'm ready for this. It's going to be encouraging, I promise you. There's a hope, there's a plan, there's a future. And so we're going to be able to see that in the book of Revelation, and that's going to kick off after Labor Day on September 13th. So that's why I preached on anxiety and worry for a couple weeks, to get us ready to look into the book of Revelation so we would be prepared and ready to go on that. But we're going to kick off today talking about humility. Humility, it's something that we all want, but we kind of have a hard time getting It's something that we all see in somebody else and we appreciate, but how do we become a person of humility? One person said it like this, being humble is something you either are or you aren't. It's not a commodity. It's not something you can achieve. It's not something you can earn or accomplish. Another definition is this, humility is realizing who you are, the gifts and resources you have, and laying them down for a greater good, for God's great glory. It's forgetting self and remembering God and others. It's washing feet, and even in Jesus' case, washing the feet that maybe you created. Humility, one more definition. I like a couple more. I'll give you this one I really like, though. Humility is self-forgetfulness. It's not the diminishing of true talent or ability or possession. It's not a pretty woman trying to convince herself she's ugly. It's not a smart man trying to convince himself he's a fool. It's not a successful person trying to convince himself it was all luck. See, that's false humility. Humility is when we go, yes, God, you've given me these gifts. You've given me these blessings, and I want to use them for your glory, not my own. I would put it like this, a personal definition uh, that, that I wrote down in thinking about this. It's to be glad something great was accomplished. Not that it was accomplished by you. It's to be glad something great was accomplished, but not that it had to be accomplished by you. See, it's not thinking less of yourself. Humility is thinking of yourself less. Do you see the difference? It's not thinking less of yourself. God's given you some great talents. God's given you some great abilities. Students, many of you are an amazing athlete, an amazing musician, an amazing artist. That's incredible. That's wonderful. It's not thinking less of yourself. Oh, yeah, this is terrible. I know that everybody else gave me the blue ribbon, but no, no, no. That's false humility. It's thinking of yourself less, meaning that God can use you in it. One last thing here. It's, it says this. Humility is not denying the power you have. It's realizing the power comes through you, not from you. It comes through you by the power of Jesus, not from you. So we're going to look and we're going to see Jesus' conversation with the Pharisees. Now, how do you think that's going to go? So we got Jesus talking to the Pharisees. Who's going to be the prideful? Who's going to be the humble? We know where this is. Jesus humble, Pharisees prideful. But we're going to look at this in Luke chapter 14. If you got your Bible, I want you to look there. And we're going to see this thing of humility. Okay? And I'm going to give you the three steps on becoming the greatest humble person ever. Do you see the irony? The three steps on becoming the greatest humble person ever. You're going to be amazed at how humble you are. And as C.S. Lewis says, whenever you become humble, you'll think, by Jove, I'm being humble. And you'll have lost it right there at that moment. 
So here we have, let's look in chapter 14. I want to show you verse 1, and then it'll give you the context, and then we'll jump down to verse 7. Okay? Verse 1, chapter 14 of Luke. One Sabbath, he went to eat at the house of one of the leading Pharisees, and they were watching him closely. They were trying to to get him caught in something. He's actually going to heal somebody. They're going to get upset about it on the Sabbath. And he's going to say, look, I'm doing this. Verse 7, here we go. Teaching on humility in verse 7 is where it begins. He told a parable to those who were invited when he noticed how they would choose the best places for themselves. Verse 8, when you are invited by someone to the wedding banquet, to a wedding banquet, don't recline at the best place because a more distinguished person then you may have been invited by your host. The one who invited both of you may come and say to you, give your place to this man. Then in humiliation, you will proceed to take the lowest place. So here's our first step out of this three steps of humility. We're going to see it here in this first section of the scripture. He's saying there's a wedding feast, and if you've got this wedding feast, don't take the best seat for yourself, because he noticed the Pharisees were running in to get the best seat. Here's the point that we need to make. Choose to be humble instead of being humbled. Choose to be humble instead of being humbled. Here it gives us, either you're going to choose to be humble by not taking the best seat, Or you're going to be humbled by somebody tapping you on the shoulder and saying, "Uh, Sir, you're not in first class, you're in coach. And instead you need to choose humility over being humbled. You and I, one of the two things are going to happen for us in that context. We're either going to choose humility or we're going to be humbled. Life has a board for every bottom. God will humble you in your pride. And I want you to know, and I want to say in my own life, I want to choose humility as opposed to being humbled by God. Now, here's the context that he puts it in. They were going in and they were trying to get the best seats. Now, let's put it into our context. Have you ever been to a gala? you ever been to a fundraiser? If you haven't, then somebody wants to invite you right now, okay, because you're ready to come. Time to give. But to be able to get in those galas, what happens is usually the more expensive seats are in the front and the less expensive tables are in the back. Have you ever gone to a wedding reception and there's the reserved tables for the wedding party? You've for sure been to a wedding, and you know what happens in a wedding. The order of importance is the way the wedding rolls. So all of us as guests, we get there whenever we get there. We should get there early, always be early for a wedding and a funeral. So be able to get there and be there early. You sit down, and then what happens? Then the grandparents come in, and they're taking down the aisle, down the grandparents' aisle, to be able to take it in. Because grandparents, you're really, really important, but you're not all that on that day. Then the parents of the groom come in. Then the bride's parents come in. Why are they a little bit further in the importance? Because it's cost them tens of thousands of dollars to walk in for those very short minutes. So Cypress, Sienna, downtown, listen up. Tens of thousands of dollars for them to get down there. So that's all they got. And the dad, he's, he's been beat up so much, he's actually walking behind the mom just like, oh my goodness, oh my goodness, oh my goodness. As one of the groomsmen, 22-year-olds got the mom there, and they go, and it's a celebration, and it's filled with tears and joy and all that. And then the groom, man, he's so important. He comes in a side door. He's so important. He doesn't even get to walk down the aisle. He just kind of shows up in a side door with all of his rented tuxedo guys next to him, and they show up, and they stand there, and they're rented tuxedos, and then what happens? Bam, ba 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 bam, ba 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 bam, ba 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 bam, ba 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 ba. And the door swings open, and there she is in that gown she'll wear that day. And then she comes walking down the aisle, and everybody stands, and everybody looks. Why? Because she is the most important person coming down that aisle. And we give it, that's good, that's how it should be. But you don't come walking down that aisle and get tapped on the shoulder and go, no, 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 you're not the bride, buddy, back of the room back of the room. Why does he give us the wedding feast as an illustration? Because we can picture it in our mind, can't we, in every culture. Jesus is also giving a picture of heaven, that he's the groom and we're the bride of Christ. Not that we're more important, that's not what I'm trying to say, but that the church, that this is a feast and we're going to be able to dine together in this intimate, wonderful relationship. So here he's saying, now when you go to a feast, there's more important people that are there. You're either going to be humbled or you're going to be humbled. 
Now, let me give you a, just a few more just thoughts, just so you can think and you can grow in your biblical knowledge of how these feasts would happen. How would these dinners happen? We would think of it like the Lord's Supper, okay? That'd be a good feast. Let me show you the classic picture of the Lord's Supper. That's the classic picture, right? So we've got Da Vinci painted this, and we've got this classic picture, and it's just one table here that's kind of the head table. That's not actually how it was arranged. Let me show you a graph of how it was arranged. It's arranged in a U-shape setting. So now you've got here, you've got Jesus as the host, Judas in the seat of honor, isn't that crazy? That shows the humility of Jesus. He's going to be able to now dip the bread and hand it to Judas and say, go and do what you're going to do, do it quickly. So that's going to happen. John's going to be right there. Now you can see why John, I'll show you in just a second, he's going to have his head on Jesus' chest. Peter is across in the seat of least honor. Why is Peter in the seat of least honor? To teach Peter humility. Watch. Why? Because God's going to use Peter like you've never seen anybody get used. He's going to preach the sermon at the day of Pentecost. He's going to be one of the pillars of the early church. So Peter's got to learn humility because a humble person is a usable person in God's hands. Now, here's what they would do. Did you notice in the scripture it said, and they reclined at the table? What did that mean? Here's how they would do it. Let's say the table was right here. They would actually get down on their left arm and they would recline at the table and they would grab like this. That's how they would eat. So they grab the food and they would recline. So now John on his left arm can lean back onto Jesus very easily, can he? So they're reclining at the table and folks would come. It takes longer to get up after you're 50, I think. So Folks would come and they try to get the best seat. They want to sit in the best seat. And Jesus is saying, look, you're either going to be humble or I'm going to humble you. And so we don't want to tap on the shoulder. No, sir, you're not supposed to be here in first class. You're supposed to be back in coach. We want to be able to trust the Lord that he can place us any place he wants to place us. And he can do his work. So here they are at this place and they choose. He's saying, I want you to choose humility. Humility is an action and humility is an attitude. And I want you to choose it over your pride. And in choosing that humility, then I'll place you wherever I want to place you. Now, let me show you, a, I want to show you a one minute video clip, okay? And I'm trying to bless you here because I'm going to show you a video clip of something we might not see much of, which is college football, okay? So I'm going to just give you just a, ah, ah, oh, this feels so good. Just for this one minute, you'll be able to have that. So then uh, when we see cardboard cutouts all over college football stadiums, we'll be able to remember way back when it was there. So this is from 2015. It's Utah versus Oregon. The Utah receiver is going to run an incredible route. He's fast as he could be. He's going to make a great catch, and he's going to run right towards the end zone. When he gets into the end zone, he's going to beat his chest in pride. He's going to point at his name on the back of his jersey, okay? I want you to see all that because I want you to catch it, and then I want you to see what happens next on this point of you can either be humble or you can be humbled. Watch this clip. Travis Wilson to pass on third down and five. A lot of time looking down the field. He's got a man open. Down the field. It's caught at the 35. At the 30. 25. 20. 15. 10. 5. It's a touchdown. Kalen Clay. Hey, why not just do that? I think they got some balance in the passing game. The play is still alive. Oregon's running the play back. Wait a minute. He, they said he fumbled it going across the goal line? Oregon's running into the end zone, and they're saying it's a touchdown back the other oh way. Oh, my gosh. Are you kidding me? They said that tra they said that Kalen Clay let go of the ball before he crossed the plane. Oh, you've got to be kidding me. And Oregon runs it back for a touchdown. What? We've got to see this on the replay. And instead of this game being 14-0 Utah, it's going to end up being 7-7. Wow, huh? How many laps do you think he ran at the next practice? <laughs> you can either be humbled or you can choose to be humble. Now, what's great and redeeming about that, this is the quote from Clay, the receiver, after all of this had happened. When I think about that game, it helped me grow as a person. It makes you realize that everything is not going to go the way you want it to go. And from that, you just have to grow from the experience. 
So he took some humility to be able to redeem it in that. But let's be the people that say, Lord, we know that we can only get to to the one yard line. We can't get into heaven on our own. If we're going to get into heaven, it's going to have to be through Jesus Christ. If we're going to walk with you in your power, you're going to have to take us to that next step. Let's look at the second step of humility in Luke chapter 14, verse 10. Here's what it says in Luke 14, verse 10. But when you are invited, notice that word, invited, go and recline, now you know what that means, at the lowest place so that when the one who invited you, he will say to you, friend, term of endearment, friend, move up higher. You will then be honored in the presence of all the other guests. Here's what he's saying is this, see yourself as invited, not as entitled. See yourself as invited, not entitled to blessings. He's saying, I want you to see that you've been invited to a feast. You're not just entitled to everything. Haven't we learned a little bit about our entitlement through these months? I mean, didn't we really kind of just expect school would be like school is? Didn't we just expect that we would do what we would do? Didn't we just expect that thousands of people would pack into worship centers? Didn't we just expect that things would happen? Didn't we just expect that football would take place? Didn't we just expect the Astros would play with stands, with fans of the stands? Didn't we just expect and expect? And it wasn't bad. It wasn't prideful. It was just the continuation of normal. But now, I don't know if you've done this, but when I did this, I remember the first time I ate in a restaurant in COVID, and it was like, oh my goodness, we got crazy. I got an iced tea and appetizers. It was off the hook. I was like blowing money. Yes, bring it. Because it was just, ah. Doesn't it feel different for those of you that are in the house right now on campus, all campuses, that you're here and you're here and it's like, oh, it feels so good to almost be invited in, you, in a sense, coming back, being back. That's incredible. Instead of how many things that we just take for granted that we felt so entitled to and so expected. And he's saying here, when you come in verse 10, it says, but when you are invited Go and recline at the lowest place and be so grateful. And then the host will come to you and say, friend, friend, a term of endearment of connection. Well, let me tell you what, Jesus is using this wedding feast as an illustration of heaven, isn't he? Because the only way that you get to heaven is that Jesus Christ has invited you through salvation by dying on the cross for your sins. That's the only way you're going to get to heaven. You're not entitled heaven. I remember growing up, I thought, well, everybody just, you just get heaven because you're a human. I mean, if you're not Hitler or Mussolini or really some, you know, serial killer, then no, you're not entitled just because you're on planet earth. You're invited by Jesus Christ. Why? Because Jesus died on the cross because he was so humble, he died on the cross. Listen to Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 through 12, 5 through 11. Your attitude should be that of Christ Jesus, who in being in the very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking on the nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and he was found in appearance as a man. And listen, he humbled himself. And was obedient unto death, even death on a cross, which was a shameful death. Why? Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place to give him the name that is above every name, that every na- at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. So Jesus Christ was humble. It's a perfect circle. Jesus' humility sent him to the cross so that we could humbly bow before the cross and receive the invitation that he's inviting us into a relationship with him. And so I hope that in your pride, you don't think you're going to make it across the goal line in your own works. You're not. It'll be a fumble at the one yard line. But in your humility, you say, Jesus, only because of you can I make it across the goal line into heaven and to be able to have a relationship with God for all of eternity because of a humility that I have to bow my knee at your cross, realizing I'm a sinner and that I need you, Jesus, to be my Savior. And if you're online right now or you're Cypress, Siena, downtown at the Loop, wherever you are, on the radio listening, I just want to encourage you that there's a wedding feast. It's in Revelation. We're going to study it later on. Talking about how you can come and be with him for all of eternity. And it comes through humility. There's not a prideful salvation moment. 
It's only a humble work of the cross. See, this parable is a wedding feast of Christ's grace, not our works, and that's the foundation of humility. And you know what that makes us? It makes us grateful instead of needy. Makes us grateful instead of needy. Now I'm grateful to God for what he's done. I'm grateful for the blessings in my life. Instead of, oh, I just want another dollar. I just want another this. I want another that. We're saying, Lord, thank you. You've already given me too much. I'm so excited. Students, I know there's a lot of things to complain about with going back to school, but you get to go to school. You get an education and a really good one at that. Now, sure, there's some things that we wish you didn't have to do. We understand that. But to be grateful instead of needy for one more. And we've gotten so many things that we've lost along the way, but to just be grateful and let God do his work. Even in my own life, I found out yesterday that tomorrow was supposed to be a family surprise party for me. That's what it was supposed to be. So Kelly's been working on that for two weeks. All my family from Louisiana was headed this direction to be able to come tomorrow night for my birthday, to be able to celebrate. Don't feel bad if you weren't invited. It's family from Louisiana. It's okay. And they're all coming together to come and to surprise me. For the birthday, for my 50th birthday. I mean, I don't know if I'll be around for another 50 years, for 100 birthdays, but the 50th birthday, they're coming to be able to be here for that. And they were all going to come be a part of that. And then, not one hurricane. (laughs) Not just a pandemic. Two hurricanes coming along. So we're going to do something fun. They've got something, you know, it's going to be great. You know, don't, don't feel sorry for me. It's okay. It's going to be wonderful. We have a great family meal together anyway. But we're going to have a good time. But man, it's just... I'm grateful. I'm just grateful nowadays. Has has COVID brought more gratitude in your life? Just to be grateful. We thought we needed so much and we didn't have it. And just be grateful instead of needy. The Pharisees were very needy. They needed to walk through the streets and everybody clap. They needed to dress a certain way and have everybody go, ooh, you're something. They needed to show off their religion. They needed to show off their power. They needed to show off their position. They needed to show off all these different things. They were so needy. They were professionals at pride. And let me tell you what will make you satisfied. Humility is satisfying. Pride makes you needy. Makes you needy. Because you got to be, and you got to keep being, and you got to keep being, and you got to keep being, and it never satisfies. It never satisfies. But when we realize it's not the power comes from us, the power comes through us. When we realize we're not too good to do anything, God can do something great in our heart. Be grateful instead of needy. And I hope, I hope that COVID has shown you that. Let me give you the opposite story, if I can, of, of, um, of the humility that Christ wants to have in us. Do you remember in Acts chapter 12, there was a guy named Herod? Herod came into this place. It was, it was right on the coast. I've actually been there. It's an amphitheater. And he came in and everybody started singing his praises. This is the way the scripture goes. Acts 12, verse 21 through 25. So on the appointed day, dressed in royal robes and seated on the throne, Herod delivered a public address to them. Can you hear pride and all those things? The assembled people began to shout, it's the voice of a God, not of a man. And at once an angel of the Lord struck him because he did not give glory to God. And he became infected with worms and died. Did you see the order? Infected with worms and then died. Some people think it took five days for him to die and it was a very painful death. Then listen to this, verse 24. Then God's message flourished and multiplied. Then God's message flourished and multiplied. God had to remove Herod before his message would flourish and multiply. Pride was standing in the way of his message going forth. Hey, I don't want to be the hindrance of God. I want to be just a tool of the Lord, don't you? I don't want to be one standing in God's way of what he wants to do in my life or in somebody else's life through me. I want him to be a, a, I want to be a conduit that God would let it come through me and the Holy Spirit's power would be in us as a church, as a believing people, as people of God and let it come through. I don't want to stand in my royal robes and hinder it and say, I got to move Greg out of the way to really get my work done. Let me tell you what was happening in that, that passage. He showed up in the morning. Why did he come in the morning? The people were assembled in the morning because the sun was just right shining onto the place where he would stand. Not only did he show where the sun would shine on him, God created the sun, but he's going to use it for his glory. Here it is. He shows up and all of his robes are silver so that he glimmered with the sun during his address. 
So somebody was in the back behind the scenes going with a headset and a microphone saying, in Herod, you're going in three, two, play the Oscar music. And then he comes out. He gives his public address with all his, and he's infected by worms and he dies. And then God goes, all right, let's get back to kingdom business. The Pharisees were pros at pride. Let's be pros at humility. And here's what it's going to take. And I said this last week, but it's worth saying two weeks in a row. Heart work is hard work. Heart work is hard work. Allow God to do in your heart some great hard work. Do your hard work. Do your homework. Get it all done. But know that this is what he's saying here. The host says, friend, friend. I want to take you to this place. Think where Peter was seated at the Lord's Supper. I want to do some hard work in you, Peter, because you're going to have to be humble, because you're going to have to, to step up on Pentecost to be able to do this. You're going to have the sheets going to come down with some food you didn't think you could eat, and I'm going to take you in a different direction with the Gentiles. All of these things are hard work God wants to do in us. God wants to do it in you. How much better would your marriage be, gentlemen, if you were humble instead of prideful? What kind of mom could you be if you were humble instead of prideful? What kind of kid could you be? What kind of student could you be? What kind of athlete could you be if you were humble instead of prideful? Einstein, of all people, puts it like this. A great quote from Einstein. He says this, try not to become a man of success. Try to become a man of value. Try not to become a man of success. Try to become a man of value because a man of value, a woman of value is always at a premium. So let's be people that contribute. Let's be people that work hard. And let's got, let God do some heart work in us. Third thing, it's found in verse 11 out of our three steps to become the greatest humble person in the history of the earth. Here we go, verse 11. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. Self-exaltation will lead to humiliation. It's another way to say it. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. And the one who humbles himself will be exalted. Here's what I want you to hear. The one who humbles himself will be exalted. Does that mean you're going to be famous? I mean, you're going to be a millionaire? Probably not. But it means that God can take you to heaven, yes, but he can use you for heavenly things here on earth. Here's the point I want to give you. Trust God to seat you where he wants you. Trust God to seat you where he wants you. Where does he want you seated? Let him put you in that seat. He can take care of all that. And right now, he seated you at your school. He seated you at your business. He placed you in your neighborhood, in your family, and you got people in your neighborhood, in your family, in your school. Some of them are scared to death about all this stuff, and some of them don't care a bit. But he's got you there for a reason to be able to talk about the Prince of Peace and to show the joy that you can have in Jesus Christ no matter what happens. He's got you in a place where everybody's got a tremendous amount of disappointments, and some disappointments are really, really hard. Hey, so I miss a, a little birthday surprise. Who cares? Life's going to go on. But some people got it really, really difficult. And we can be able to step into their life and to be able to love them and to care for them in that time. God is seating you and seating me wherever he wants to do it. And here's what you do. You just say, Lord, I'm humble. I'll sit wherever you want. I don't have to fight for the best seat. I don't have to fight for the front row. You put me where you want to put me. If you want to put me in standing room only, put me in standing room only. If I need to be outside, I'll be outside, but I just want to be where you are. Now, of course, we pray hard. Of course, we work hard. Of course, we're strategic. Yes, try to get ahead in a good way, not in the flesh, but in the spirit. Work hard. Do your homework, students. Do your homework, parents. Do your homework, employees and employers. Do the best you possibly can. Be prepared. Be ready to go. All that stuff, but still at the same time say, God, I trust you, and I just rest in you because he took the cross in humility and God exalted him in eternity. First Peter chapter 5, verse 6 says, Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Luke chapter 18, Jesus repeats what he says here in Luke 14. Whoever exalts himself will be humbled, but he who humbles himself will be exalted. James 4, 6, but he gives greater grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud. I don't want God to resist me or our church or you. God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So what do we do? Here's what we do. We choose to be humble instead of being humbled. We are invited. We see our lives as invited instead of entitled to blessings. 
And then third and finally, we trust God to seat us wherever he wants to seat us. One of the big things that's happened during COVID is that we've all been watching probably too much TV. And so, uh, you know, we've been getting, you know, you've, you've signed up for Netflix possibly. Maybe you're a Hulu person. I don't know. But Disney Plus is just like, bam, just taken off with Disney Plus. And one of the reasons Disney Plus is taken off so much is because Hamilton was available on Disney Plus. And so I'm seeing some head nods in the room online. Maybe you're watching Hamilton on one screen and me on another screen. I'm not sure what you're doing. But to be able uh, to see Hamilton, so see Santa Cypress downtown, you've been watching it too possibly. Well, we went, Kelly and I went, my wife and I went to New York City back when you could go to New York City, okay? It was in the BC era, before COVID, right? So we went to New York and we were there and it was a great trip and our, our hotel was kind of close to Times Square there in Broadway and so um, Kelly was getting ready and I got ready a little bit uh, faster than she got ready. Uh, most homes, the man gets faster ready and he wins the battle. So I said, hey, here's what I'm going to do. I'm ready before you. Um, I don't want to just sit in the room. I'm going to go over and I'm just going to see if we can get tickets to Hamilton and just see what happens. You know, maybe there'll be some Hamilton tickets somebody will get back and we'll get, we'll score some Hamilton tickets. So she said, great, no problem. And I said, just text me, call me and I'll tell you where I am and here's where it is on such such street. So um, I go over there. And so what do you do in Texas when you need to get tickets? You walk up and down the street, you put up how many tickets you need. I need two. So I put up two tickets like I'm at an SEC game and I'm walking down, you know, whatever street it is doing this because everybody's lined up because nobody wants to be late. And I'm just waiting for somebody. Oh, that's great. And then I've got, you know, I've got this amount of cash in one pocket to go, that's all I got. And then I got a little bit more and over here, you know, uh, I wasn't going to deceive, but I, you know, I had to, you know, you got to play, you just, you don't want to show all your cards. So I'm doing this. And so this guy pulls me aside that works for Hamilton. Uh, uh, not like, I think the real Hamilton has been dead for a while, but works for the play Hamilton. And so he pulls me and says, Hey, in a great New York hospitality. Hey, what do you think you're doing? I said, well, sir, I'm trying to get maybe two extra tickets. Somebody maybe had two extra tickets. You want to get arrested? I said, no, sir, I'm from Texas. I mean, I don't have a clue what's going on, okay, in this entire thing. And the last thing I want to do is get thrown in a New York jail, okay? So I do, I do not want to get arrested. He said, here's how you do it. I said, okay. He said, sometimes we have extra tickets. If you want extra tickets, you sit on that little stoop right there against the wall. And you wait, and then we'll call you when everybody else has gone in, and then we'll see if we got extra tickets for you. So I was like, Okay, uh, but I'm thinking, I'm like, I don't, I don't know if I want to do that, you know, is what I'm trying to think, you know, because he's kind of fronting me, and I'm kind of, I don't know if I want, and I'm like, no, nah, you know, I'll be humble, right? So I sit down on this kind of dirty sidewalk stoop and lean up against the wall, and it's kind of like a curb on a curb, and then all the people with tickets are going by, so it's the ticket people, and then it's the street, so all the ticket people are going by, and they're all looking at me like, <laughs> right? They're like, we're going to the theater, and you're out here, you know. So I'm just sitting there, and it's a couple of people in front of us, and I'm not mad. I'm just, you know, kind of people watching. And so, uh, so then Kelly comes, and so I said, have a seat now that you've gotten ready uh, on the stoop here of the dirty curb in New York City. So we sit here, and they start pulling in two people, and then they pull in the next two people, and they pull in the next two people. So finally, we get in, and we're the last two people they call in. And we come in, and we're standing there at the window, and the guy goes, we only got one seat left. And we got a standing room only seat. And so she's looking at me. She's like, we don't have to do this. And I said, no, you do it. You get the seat. No, no, we don't have to. I don't want you to have to stand. So we're kind of doing this, and he's like, come on already. You know what I mean? He's, so we're like, let's do it. Okay, let's just do it. We're here. You know, let's just go for it. So we did it. And so we bought the seat. So we walk in the door. And so now uh, we got these two tickets and I got standing room only. We walk up to the lady that's like showing you where your seats are. And we don't know where the seat is. We just bought it, right? We just got it. We got this incredible deal, like, I mean, really, really, really low price type of thing. And so we get it. So we don't, we, we're expecting the back of the room. So they look at Kelly's seat and they go, okay, ma'am, follow me. And they start walking to the front and she's on the seventh row on the aisle at the front that's standing there. And I'm there, and I've got, I'm like watching this happen. I'm like, yeah, this is good. This is good. She'll have a great time. With Who knows? I'm in standing room only. So I tell her, I said, I'm in standing room only, um, but, you know, you just took my wife down there. If another seat comes available, I'll be way back in the back by the peanuts that cost $95, and I'll be back there, and you just, and just, just wave at me, and I'll just sit down. If you find another seat, somebody doesn't show up. And she says, well, follow me. And so she takes me to about the 15th row and sits me down on the 15th row where somebody isn't going to show up or, you know, I don't know, and she knows it's blank. So I sit down there. So Kelly's down there, and I'm like, <laughs> and she's like, ah. 
<laughs> so we do that for like, you know, back and forth, back and forth. So I start making friends on how much your seats cost. <laughs> and so we, you know, we switched during intermission. But it was incredible. I mean, I was just like, I just want to be in the room where it happens, in the room where it happens, in the room where it happens. That's a line from Hamilton for those that haven't seen it. So we're here in that. But you know what? Let me tell you what. Just to give you an illustration, not that that's any big thing, just a little thing to end with. Are you and I ready to be standing room only? Will we sit on the stoop? Will we do whatever God wants us to do? And say, Lord, I'll be outside. If we don't even get in, it's fine. But Lord, if you get us in, I'll be standing room only. And even at standing room only, I'll let you seat me where you want to seat me. And what happens is God does something in your heart that begins to be a humble spirit. Humility is an action, but it's also an attitude. And it comes from great heart work. And we'll all have bursts of pride. There's no doubt about it. But let God place you where he wants to place you. And when he places you there, you just be faithful. You just be faithful. And you know what? He can move you up anytime he wants to move you up. And then when you get there, guess what happens? You're humble before him and you're usable. And you're grateful. So seventh row, 15th row, standing room only, outside the door, didn't get in. Just grateful to be here, God. Just grateful to be here. Father, we come in Jesus' name and we thank you for a conversation with Pharisees over humility. We thank you, Lord, for the conversation you want to have with us about it. Father, show us where we're prideful. How much better could our marriages be if we weren't prideful and we had to be right? How much greater could we parent? What a blessing students could be if they walked in on day one and they were humble. And not, well, we didn't get to do this and we didn't get to do that. But just be grateful they're getting a great education. So, Father, we want to score touchdowns for you. But it only comes through Christ. So let us quit pointing to our name and point to your name. And let us walk with you, God, in a humble way. And one day, one day for the believers in Christ. We'll be in heaven around the throne singing holy, holy, holy. We'll be robed in white and we will be at the wedding feast of feasts. And it'll all be by grace, not by works. Last thing before we worship. Do you know Christ as your Savior? He was so humble, he died on a cross for you. Ask him to save your soul. To forgive your sins. And to be your Savior. If you already know Christ as Savior, walk in humility, not in pride. Thank God for the blessings. Let him work through you. You don't have to act like you're not smart. You don't have to act like you're not successful. You don't have to act like you're not a hard worker. You don't have to act like you're not this or that. Just give it to him. Be grateful, not needy. We love you, God. We humbly bow before you. And we just say, Lord, we want to be a humble church to be usable for eternal purposes in your hands. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, thanks for watching. To find out more about Houston's First, you can subscribe to our channel or you can go to houstonsfirst.org.